micro front ends. Micro front ends offer a lot of interesting benefits, including scaling your code base with your organization, releasing code faster, and providing a better customer experience. How do we know that they're right for our project though? These are some of the things that I plan to cover in this video. It is a series on micro front end architecture, including implementation, hands-on approaches, and working with various frameworks and tooling. This is the first video though, where I plan to focus on things like the terminology, the approach, and just answering some of those initial questions you'll have on your micro front end journey. In future videos, I will have code hands-on videos where we can kind of go through the various tooling together. I hope you like it. If you do, like and subscribe. Stay tuned for those videos. So let's talk about what micro front ends are. Go over the terminology. Micro front ends are portions of your application. So usually an experience that's a part of your larger experience. So when you take these pieces, these micro front ends, and you put them together, you receive kind of that full product and user user experience. So when you break your application up into these pieces, they're called micro front ends. How do we know they're a good fit though for our organization and our project? Well, if you have a larger organization or a larger project where you might have multiple teams working on the same front end application, that's usually one sign. So having more and more teams in one monolithic code base can represent a number of different challenges, things you, you might be running into today. One of them could be, I need to release code. When I release my code, I have features or, or portions of code that's committed from other teams that may not be validated. There could be bugs or the experience might not be ready for customers to consume. Now I could use feature flags and there's you know other approaches that I can take to kind of hide that functionality until it's ready. These things though are adding technical debt back into the platform into the project right now I'm managing these flags, removing these flags later. And they're just not the experience, developer experience that we're looking for. Micro front ends can help solve that challenge. Another thing that I think micro front ends benefit is when you look at other approaches to breaking up your code base, these could be things like creating a, an NPM package. Maybe you're breaking apart your code base, putting in features and things within these packages you have a team that's managing those, they're releasing these packages, you're consuming them. And there's a number of things about that that can slow down your development. So, you know, this can be, you know, who's maintaining them, you know, how is that work put on their backlog? How is it being prioritized? How are we consuming it in our application? Did we get, you know, all of the various contracts and features and requirements right? Um, other other things to look out for is uh, even kind of tooling impedance, right? When you start having large code bases, you know, linting, prettier, you know, unit testing, integration tests, these all take longer and longer. And as a development team, when you have multiple people a day, maybe every hour checking in code, you could start to get kind of this log jam effect where releasing is very slow, very painful. And if you have an issue where you have to roll back or something has to be done in that environment, it's, it's very, you know, it's very disruptive to the development process as a whole. Micro front ends can help solve some of these issues. So how do we get started with micro front ends? Well, with micro front ends, one way to get started is let's look at a, a pretty familiar site to most people. And when we start looking at the site here, it's an e-commerce site. It's very product focused. There's a lot of different products that are available here on this page. Lots of different widgets, but one thing we can say is this page is very product focused. Probably most of the data here is coming from some type of product API. There could be things that where you have more personalized results that might be coming from maybe something that's more user centric. But the key thing to think about here is when I'm trying to create these logical separations to figure out how do I break apart a monolith into pieces, um, having that kind of vertical slice all the way, you know, kind of to the back end is one place that's ideal, right? That's that's kind of where we want to be, right? When we think about a team producing code, you know, these these micro front ends having that kind of ability if they can work full stack all the way to their back end services 
It's definitely a huge plus. If not, we could start looking at some of these various widgets here on the screen, and we could see, as an example, this back to school resources section. Some of this might be very dynamic. There could be, you know, marketing or somebody kind of driving these things, and, and some of it could be done maybe through a configuration service, but just using it as an example here, let's say these things are kind of drastically changed and maybe this represents one widget, a team could own that as a micro front end, right? This could be part of, you know, your, uh, your, your product carousel. You know, different things that are very related to each other. So again, another, another example here too is the cart page. So when you think about a cart, right, you're thinking about, you know, some type of overview page, you're looking at the products you have, you're ready to proceed. Uh, maybe you have like some type of list feature, they can save things for later, go back to it. Um, you know, the next kind of logical step here is payment, right? You proceed from, you know, product selection, cart, checkout, right? And you're, and you're trying to check out, you're selecting payments, you're managing those payments. These are all, I think, very kind of logical ways to break things up. And again, it could be at a page level, or it could be an individual kind of widget or a portion of that user experience on a page. Here's a visualization of that split, just going over the same concepts, products, cart, <clears throat> and payments. So when you look at kind of the various components that make up these, and you think about them kind of where their data comes from, right? What are their data sources, what services, et cetera? You could kind of see here that, you know, in this, this is very simplistic, but you can kind of see this vertical split here. Okay, this is where I would start, right? Maybe I pick one of these and I start from there. Um, and we, you know, we kind of refine that micro front end experience. It's a very valid approach. You know, if your monolith application contains similar concepts and you can draw these boundaries, you know, using something like a strangler pattern can very much get you into the micro front end architecture. The next logical step here to kind of talk about is what do we do with our code? What's, what's going on with our code base, right? So you're in a monolithic app, you're in a mono repo today, your mono repo, let's say, as you know, all of these kind of concepts together, maybe this is features instead of apps, you know, you have shared code in there, it's being leveraged all over the place, um, and you have to go poly repo, mono repo, what do we do? Poly repo at the surface level, I think feels good to a lot of people because they instantly think team autonomy, right? We could fix so many things if we just put stuff in a separate repo. And that's not really the case, right? Poly repos offer a lot of advantages, um, you know, cleaner get history, uh, cleaner releases, right? You have a single artifact, uh, a less overwhelming workspace as well. You know, when you think about your workspace and the tooling and all of the projects, when you get to maybe a big micro front end project, it can be overwhelming, right? There's a lot there. Now in the mono repo approach, one of the things that's great about the mono repo, or some of the things I should say, is you can manage dependencies a lot easier. So let's say you have a package that has a security vulnerability and you want to remediate that. Well, instead of going to n number of repositories and opening issues and tracking those issues and then updating that package and tracking releases, you know, you can really just kind of go into the mono repo and see things a little more clear. Uh, the same thing kind of, um, I think, is true across tooling as well. With poly repos, you're in silos, things are drifting. You know your uh, you know your processes can change in the mono repo. It's a little harder to do that, and you could still keep all that autonomy in the mono repo. If you're using GitHub, GitHub code owners uh, code owners allow you to you know put different approvers based on a directory structure. Um, you could still implement the same branch protection rules, uh, and you could still have that level of team autonomy in terms of releases and approvals that you have in a poly repo. Um, let's kind of go over this structure here. So if you can kind of imagine you're taking your features and you're structuring them almost in this mono repo of apps, right? So you have your products, cart, and your payments, and then you have shared. Shared is kind of a good, in my opinion, it's a good intermediate step from taking your mono repo into the micro front end architecture, because instead of going right to packages, where if you had a poly repo, you would have to take your shared code and you would have to start developing packages right away, right? So that's an additional step in that process of breaking things apart where all of a sudden I need a repo for packages. I need who's maintaining that repo, who's developing it, what are we putting in there? How do we determine the scope? And there's all kinds of questions that come up. And, you know, again, in the mono repo, you can kind of just put things off to the side in a different, you know, directory, more or less, right? And you can use these build time, you know, code artifacts 
in your development and figure out down the road, how do I, do I make these packages? Do I need to, what benefit do we get? And then answer all those other questions as well. So the mono repo is a very powerful tool and it just needs to be used correctly in other words. So let's talk about mono repo tooling. So one of my favorite tools is, is PNPM. So when it comes to package management, PNPM is very powerful, offers a lot of advantages, you know, performance, um, you know, deduplication, caching, uh, it's got, you know, filtering tools, it's got workspaces. Most of the package managers have those nowadays, but in my opinion, if I'm starting a project, especially a large mono repo, PNPM is, is what I'm choosing for those reasons. If I want something that's a little bit more kind of batteries included and offers more <clears throat> opinionated way of doing things, uh, has a lot more features, one of the things I'm looking at is NX. So NX is a great mono repo tool. Some of the advantages of NX is that it offers the NX cloud. And really it, some of the things that it's trying to solve is I have all of these different dependencies in my mono repo, right? which by the way, NX has a visualization tool for dependencies, but I wanna be able to have someone build the dependency and then leverage it again, right? I don't have to build all of my dependencies every time I run a project, right? Can I reuse that? Can I cache it? NX is working to solve those things. It has generators, so you can, you know, scaffold out applications quickly, packages quickly, um, you know, all of the different frameworks. It's got first-class support for one of the my favorite micro front end framework, which is module federation we'll talk about here in a minute. Um, NX is a wonderful tool, definitely something that I recommend looking at. So if you're starting or you're migrating your repo, NX has plenty of migration support too. So you could probably get up, get up and running pretty quickly. Definitely check out their documentation and their samples. Now let's talk about micro front end tooling. So micro front end tooling, this is the actual frameworks that you're using to build micro front ends. So you might be using React, you might be using Vue, or you might be using different framework of your choice, right? Pick your framework. Uh, single spa is, a, they call it a front end micro service framework, but it's, it's a micro front end framework, right? It's uh, using System.js and ECMAScript modules with import maps within your browser. So this is a browser side technology. Um, it's been out for a while. A lot of these things have been, you know, production proven. It is single spa. It is a framework. So it's going to offer tooling. It's going to offer patterns, you know, some opinionated design, and it's going to give you some extra features out of the box. Now, it also offers support for module federation instead of system.js and import maps as a way to do your micro frontends. Now, module federation is a Webpack 5 plugin, which means that if you're using Webpack today, most projects are, especially if you have an existing application. So with it being a Webpack 5 plugin, you don't even have to install a package, which means your bar of entry to getting into micro frontends is very low. So when you talk about, well, how do I get started with it? Well, there's tons of documentation. They have an official site. You can add the plugin. It's pretty, the, the configuration for it is very minimal. You're not really changing much at all in terms of your code. Uh, and you're, you're getting a lot of different benefits, um, things that Single Spa doesn't provide, such as support for server-side rendering, right? So if you're using something like Next.js or Node, uh, you, you know, Node has module federation as well. Um, module federation is, has a great community. If you go to their GitHub repository, they have tons of examples. I mean, anything you could think of, Angular, uh, Vite or Vite, um, you know, React, Next, you know, server-side rendering, there are tons of examples. There's the official documentation as well. And it's a very popular framework, so you'll generally find lots of things out there on the internet as well to support the team. So if you do run into an issue, you know, and you don't open an issue and you're just kind of surfing around Stack Overflow, you will find things about module federation, which is very important, right? You should be choosing tools that have great community support, great documentation, um, and have a following, right? Those are very important in terms of, um, you know, keeping the developer experience high. So module federation, again, is kind of my choice. The future videos I'll be focusing on module federation, the implementation of it, 
We'll be going over different patterns with micro front ends, things that you wouldn't typically run into with um, you know, a standard monolithic application. How do you solve them? What are some ways of, of just kind of navigating the space, right? Structuring things, TypeScript. There's, there's a very kind of packed list of uh, items within micro front ends. They're not terribly difficult to solve, but they do tend to have a little bit of uh, a learning curve to them, right? With any new technology, you would expect the same out of a microservice architecture. So I hope you join me on those future videos. I would love to go over and, and do some hands-on coding and really kind of break these problems down. All right. Thank you for tuning in. I hope to see you on the next video where I can kind of jump into these frameworks a little bit and we can build a monolithic uh, application and tear it apart with micro front-end architecture and see where it takes us. Thank you.